Hi friends, my name is Benjamin, and today I want to tell you another heartbreaking story. On November 16th, 2012, a distressing 911 call was received by the dispatch center in Lake County, Ohio. The caller, a highly agitated teenage girl, struggled to communicate due to extreme distress. Eventually, it became clear that she was reporting that her older sister was attacking their mother. Law enforcement quickly responded to the residence where they encountered the frantic caller. She explained that her older sister, 18-year-old Sabrina Zunik, was stabbing their mother. Upon their arrival, Sabrina emerged from the house holding a bloodied knife. Police demanded she drop the weapon and she complied. Inside the residence, a gruesome scene awaited them. Lisa Marie McIntosh, born on May 20th, 1971, in Reynoldsburg, Ohio, was the daughter of William and Rita McIntosh. Lisa, a single mother, had a daughter from a previous relationship. In 2006, she married Kevin Nofel, who had a son from a prior relationship. The couple welcomed their daughter in 2009. Lisa, a social worker specializing in child abuse cases with the Department of Children and Family Services, had a genuine passion for aiding others. Demonstrating their commitment to helping children, Kevin and Lisa decided to become foster parents. A friend of Lisa noted, when she had foster children, she treated them like her own. She made sure she went the extra mile to be a good parent. In the summer of 2011, Sabrina Zunik, aged 16 at the time, became part of their household. Sabrina Zunik was born on October 27, 1994, in the vicinity of Cleveland, Ohio. Her upbringing was marked by significant challenges, as both of her parents grappled with alcohol and substance abuse issues, leading to a highly unstable home environment. Sabrina's early experiences were marred by the criminal troubles of her parents, and even during her infancy, she was exposed to substances like vodka in her bottle to induce sleep. These circumstances contributed to Sabrina developing behavioral and mental health issues, including ADHD, oppositional defiance disorder, bipolar disorder, anxiety, and depression. Following the removal from her parents' custody, Sabrina went to live with her grandmother. Unfortunately, her grandmother's declining health coincided with Sabrina's teenage years, and her rebellious behavior became challenging for her grandmother to handle. At the age of 14, Sabrina entered the foster care system, experiencing placements in various homes and group settings before ultimately being placed with Lisa and Kevin Nofel in 2011. Under the care of Kevin and Lisa, Sabrina made strides in turning her life around. She began attending school regularly, achieved good grades, and aspired to become a massage therapist. Sabrina seamlessly integrated into the family, forming positive connections with the two girls and actively participating in school. When she reached the age of 18 and was eligible to leave foster care, Sabrina opted to stay with Lisa and Kevin to complete her education, expressing contentment in their home. However, the tragic question arises. What drove Sabrina to fatally stab her foster mother in the presence of Lisa's two young daughters? On the fateful evening of November 16, 2012, while Kevin was away working as a truck driver, Lisa was at home with the children. During the night, the teenage and three-year-old daughters heard their mother's screams and discovered Sabrina repeatedly stabbing Lisa. In the midst of the horrifying scene, the younger child sought refuge in a closet while Lisa's teenage daughter desperately pleaded with Sabrina to stop the assault and promptly called 911. The situation was described as absolutely chaotic, with the distraught caller informing the police that her sister was fatally stabbing their mother. At the scene, Lisa Neufel was pronounced dead, and Sabrina was arrested on the spot, and the murder weapon, a 15-inch knife with a 9-inch blade, convex and serrated, lacking a hilt, was recovered from the house. Notably, Sabrina did not dispute her responsibility for the act, acknowledging that she was the one who stabbed Lisa to death. Despite the disturbing nature of the murder, the police were troubled by the brutality of the attack on Lisa Nofel, who had opened her home to care for a teenager. The assault involved almost 200 stab wounds, 
reflecting a vicious and violent act. Lisa's husband, 42-year-old Kevin Nofel, who worked as a truck driver and was away in Michigan at the time, was notified by the police about Lisa's death. Kevin contacted 911, inquiring about the well-being of the girls, and was advised to pick them up from the police department. Kevin retrieved them at 5 a.m. that morning. Over the next 10 months, law enforcement worked diligently to piece together the puzzle surrounding the crime. Investigation findings pointed to a shift in the dynamics of the Nofel household around December 2011. Sabrina Zunich, initially content in the home, began to have conflicts with Lisa. Jealousy emerged as a significant factor, with Sabrina expressing resentment towards Lisa, accusing her of favoring Haley and Megan, the two younger girls in the family. The question loomed. Could these tensions have motivated Sabrina to commit the heinous act of killing Lisa? Several months after her arrest, Sabrina made an offer to cooperate with the police in exchange for a potential parole possibility after 30 years, as opposed to a life sentence without parole. In her statements, Sabrina disclosed a shocking claim. She alleged to have had a sexual relationship with her foster father, Kevin. According to Sabrina, this relationship commenced in the spring of 2012, and she asserted that it was Kevin's idea to plot and execute the murder of Lisa. Following Sabrina's arrest, Kevin Nofel faced charges related to the murder of his wife, Lisa. He was accused of conspiracy to commit aggravated murder, complicity to aggravated murder, and six counts of sexual battery. Kevin entered a plea of not guilty. During the trial, which focused on Kevin's charges exclusively, Sabrina, who had pleaded guilty, agreed to testify as a witness for the prosecution against Kevin. The prosecution's case asserted that while there was no dispute over Sabrina being the one who physically stabbed Lisa to death, they contended that Kevin was aware of and involved in planning the murder. The prosecution argued that Kevin desired to end his relationship with Lisa as indicated by statements made to friends about a potential divorce. They further claimed that Kevin stood to gain financially from Lisa's death due to the existence of multiple insurance policies. During the trial, the prosecution presented evidence suggesting a change in Lisa Nofel's behavior leading up to her tragic death. Testimony from Lisa's co-worker indicated that Lisa seemed distracted and was making an effort to stay focused in the months before her murder. She also mentioned delivering food to Kevin the day after Lisa's death, noting that his demeanor appeared normal, and she observed a picture of Sabrina on the refrigerator. Kevin's apparent lack of emotional response was further highlighted when she saw him at Lisa's funeral, describing him as emotionless. Another co-worker testified that Lisa underwent a noticeable change in 2012. Lisa began taking private calls away from her desk and these calls appeared to upset her. When she spoke to Kevin the day after Lisa's murder, he remarked that making up $50,000, equivalent to Lisa's salary, would be a significant challenge. The prosecution detailed Kevin's behavior upon discovering Lisa's death by calling witnesses to the stand. Police officers involved in the case described Kevin as calm during their interactions. Patrolmen, who met Kevin a few hours after Lisa's death in the police station lobby, noted that Kevin seemed relatively calm during that encounter. Detective Brian Jackson from the Willoughby Hills Police Department testified during the trial, recounting an interaction with Kevin the day after Lisa's murder. Kevin expressed a desire to enter the house, and Detective Jackson advised against it, explaining that the scene had not been cleaned. Despite the gruesome circumstances, Kevin exhibited no visible emotion and insisted on seeing the scene for himself, stating that he had encountered similar situations multiple times. The prosecution presented a case concerning the insurance money, revealing that Kevin had collected insurance funds following Lisa's death. Testimonies emphasized Kevin's swift actions on the very morning of Lisa's murder. It was disclosed that Kevin had called Lisa's workplace to inquire about the necessary paperwork for making a claim on Lisa's life insurance policy with the union. Jill Reynolds, a benefits specialist at Gordon Food Services, where Kevin was employed as a transit driver, testified that on the day Lisa was killed, Kevin contacted her to report Lisa's death 
and expressed his intention to file an insurance claim. This information was crucial in establishing a timeline of Kevin's actions and decisions in the immediate aftermath of the tragedy, contributing to the prosecution's narrative regarding the financial implications surrounding Lisa's death. The prosecution informed the court that Kevin filed multiple insurance claims on November 16th, including a $250,000 life policy for Lisa Nofel. This policy, issued on May 16th, 2012, covered her life. Christopher Eddy, a team leader at Guardian Life Insurance Company, stated that Guardian Life, which provides insurance for Cuyahoga children and family services, issued a check for $250,000 to Kevin as payment for the claim. Kevin received $150,000 from Farmers Insurance for a term life insurance policy purchased in 2009 for Lisa. Following Lisa's death, Kevin altered the insurance policy on the property, changing it from renters to homeowners insurance and adding a swimming pool. Kevin also acquired automobile insurance for a 2013 cruise, a 2011 Malibu, and two campers. He utilized the funds not only to settle his home mortgage, but also to purchase new cars and a residence in Florida, along with funding flying lessons. In total, Lisa held nearly $800,000 in life insurance policies, all of which Kevin collected. During the trial, the prosecution called Sabrina as a witness, who testified that her relationship with her foster father, Kevin, began in the spring of 2012. In her testimony before the court, Sabrina recounted that Kevin typically drove her to Willoughby South High School, and during these rides, they engaged in sexual activities. She stated that Kevin explained he couldn't divorce Lisa due to concerns about sharing custody of Haley. According to Sabrina, the notion of killing Lisa originated as a small idea. Kevin would occasionally text her expressing his dislike for Lisa and conveyed the idea that once Lisa was out of the picture, they could purchase their own home, live together, and Sabrina could attend college while taking on a maternal role for the children. Sabrina informed the court that she initially approached her friend Autumn Pavlik in early October, inquiring about finding someone to kill her foster mother. Autumn testified. She asked me if I was able to get her a hitman. She said that they were going to get a divorce and she was worth more dead than alive. However, Sabrina ultimately decided to handle the situation herself. She testified that on November 15, 2012, Kevin drove her to school, but upon parking, he began crying. Sabrina claimed that Kevin revealed they had a severe fight with Lisa the previous night and that he would contemplate suicide if Lisa wasn't dead. Sabrina told the court, I was scared for him because I had fallen in love with him. In response, Sabrina assured Kevin that she would take on the responsibility of killing Lisa, and less than 24 hours later, Lisa was dead. The prosecution presented Dr. Joseph Andrew Filo, a forensic pathologist affiliated with the Cuyahoga County Medical Examiner's Office, to provide testimony regarding the severe injuries sustained by Lisa. Dr. Filo oversaw the autopsy of Lisa. According to Dr. Filo's testimony, Lisa suffered a fatal injury in the mandible, jaw region, penetrating deeply enough to sever the carotid artery connected to the brain. Another lethal wound was identified in her breast, penetrating through and causing the collapse of the underlying lung. Dr. Filo described several cuts on Lisa's body as intricate and complex, suggesting that the knife involved either twisted upon entry or the body was in a twisting motion. Notably, one of Lisa's fingers and one thumb were nearly severed. Defensive wounds were also evident on Lisa's body. Dr. Filo concluded that the cause of death was attributed to multiple stab and incised wounds, at least 178 in total, of head and neck, torso and extremities with musculoskeletal, vascular, and visceral injuries. The brutality of the assault was underscored by the fact that the knife used had become bent due to the extreme violence inflicted during the attack. The defense asserted that Kevin was not guilty and placed sole responsibility for Lisa's death on Sabrina. They emphasized the absence of physical evidence supporting a sexual relationship between Kevin and Sabrina, highlighting that the prosecution solely relied on Sabrina's testimony, 
which they argued was unreliable given her agreement to a plea deal for a reduced sentence. The defense contended that Sabrina's motive for killing Lisa was rooted in a conversation two weeks prior to the tragedy. According to their case, Lisa informed Sabrina that she needed to move out by January 1st, 2013. Kevin chose not to testify during the trial. The court was informed that despite the inability to recover text messages or phone call records between Sabrina and Kevin, official records revealed a substantial amount of communication, 1491 texts or calls, exchanged between their cell phones from November 1st, 2012 to November 16th, 2012. Notably, there were 78 calls or texts documented from 7.12 p.m. on November 15th to 12.48 a.m. on November 16th, just half an hour before Lisa's tragic death. After nearly 10 hours of deliberation, the jury reached a verdict, finding Kevin guilty on all 11 counts. The charges included six counts of sexual battery, three counts of complicity to commit aggravated murder, and two counts of conspiracy to commit aggravated murder. Subsequently, Kevin received a life sentence in prison with the chance of parole after 30 years. Sabrina, having pleaded guilty to aggravated murder, was also sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 30 years. The legal proceedings concluded with both individuals facing significant penalties for their roles in the tragic events. Hence, at present, Kevin remains behind bars at the Lake Erie Correctional Institution in Connaught, Ohio, with an expected parole date of 2043, while Sabrina is incarcerated at the Dayton Correctional Institution in Dayton, Ohio, with an expected parole date of 2042. What do you think of today's story? Write your opinion about this case in the comments. I thank you for your attention and recommend subscribing to the channel, as well as clicking on the bell to not miss new videos that are released daily. Take care of yourself and your loved ones. See you soon.